Hey, Dave. Yeah, Randy. Since we founded Bombas, we've always said our socks, underwear, and T-shirts are super soft. Any new ideas? Maybe sublimely soft. Or disgustingly cozy. Wait, what? I got it. Bombas. Absurdly comfortable essentials for yourself and for those facing homelessness. Because one purchased equals one donated. Wow, did we just write an ad? Yes. Bombus. Big comfort for everyone. Go to bombus.com slash ACAST and use code ACAST for 20% off your first purchase. Welcome to episode 224 of Real Life Ghost Stories. And to kick things off this week, I would like to say thank you to some of our newest Patreon subscribers. I would like to thank Shannon Lloyd, Gracie May, Jess the Historian, Stephanie Dieter, Linda Fierro, Daniela Sanchez, Tina Mason, and Rebecca Von Groot. Thank you so much for subscribing to the Patreon. I love you and appreciate you every single day. And our film review this week, our film review is The Killing of a Sacred Deer. The Killing of a Sacred Deer was released in 2017. It has 7 out of 10 on IMDb and 79% on Rotten Tomatoes. Dr. Stephen Murphy is a renowned cardiovascular surgeon who presides over a spotless household with his wife and two children. Lurking at the margins of his idyllic suburban existence is Martin, a fatherless teen who insinuates himself into the doctor's life in gradually unsettling ways. Soon the full scope of Martin's intent becomes menacingly clear when he confronts Stephen with a long-forgotten transgression that will shatter his domestic bliss forever. As always, we're going to do likes and dislikes, so let's start with our likes. So this film was directed by Yorgos Lanthimos. I think I'm saying that correctly. But Yorgos Lanthimos is the director behind Poor Things. He also did The Lobster and The Favourite, neither of which I've seen, but I've heard people say good things about those films. Um, I had just been to see Poor Things this week and I absolutely loved it. I had never seen anything by this director before and I thought that Poor Things was just so bonkers and fun and poignant and lots of other things and and I I really enjoyed it so I was really excited to see this film too and I had read that this film is like similarly different and similarly kind of off the beaten track to what Poor Things was and indeed as I've heard The Lobster and The Favourite so so I was excited to see it also you guys know I love to champion an Irish actor and Colin Farrell is in there as well as Barry Keoghan so I was like let's watch this let's give it a go. I thought the story was really original and really interesting and I liked the way the story opened so you have these surgeons doing obviously really complex life or death surgery and then as they leave they're discussing the watches that they've bought which seems so at odds with the gravity of the situation that they are in and I guess in a way it goes some way to show that there's such a flippancy involved in this for these particular surgeons so in the morning they're doing life-saving cardiovascular surgery where kind of one one wrong move could kill somebody but it it's just every it's just a work day for them and then they're discussing something as ridiculous and mundane as where they got their watches from and I did think from the off that that was an interesting point that Lanthimos was making And you see later in the film, Dr. Stephen Murphy and his wife, who's also a doctor, they are at the receiving end of this flippancy. The tables turn later in the film when doctors are making what they see as flippant decisions or not doing enough for them. And they're dealing with the frustration of that. I think the thing that completely unnerved me about this film was the soundtrack. The soundtrack was genius. And honestly, it struck genuine terror and fear into me at various points in the film even though nothing particularly scary was going on like in this film you're not this isn't a movie about jump scares or supernatural beings or ghosts or ghouls or anything like that but that soundtrack honestly rattled me to my core there were various points in the film where I honestly considered pausing it or muting it because I just couldn't handle the music and I'm saying that as a good thing because that's 
what you want from a musical score. If you want people to feel unsettled, then that needs to be reflected in the music. And I thought it absolutely was in this film reflected in the music. And I know that this is probably not going to be a popular opinion, but that is uh, that's about all that I liked about this film. And that brings me very swiftly to the dislikes. Um, I'm just going to say it just because the acting is weird. I don't think that necessarily means that it's good. And maybe I just didn't get it. You know, maybe I just didn't get the film. But the first thing that really irked me the whole way through was that none of the characters spoke with any emotional inflection in their voices at all. So they spoke like this all the time. Everybody's sentences were clipped and lacked any emotion. And it got to the point in the film where I was like, what in the world is happening? Am I having some sort of neurological episode? Like, why are they all speaking with absolutely no emotion? And I looked it up and apparently it was a directorial choice that Lanthimos made them all speak without any emotion in their voices for the duration of the film. There are a couple of moments where Nicole Kidman's character and Colin Farrell's character get a bit upset but it, it it's not it's not particularly upset given the circumstances I would say it is a very muted reaction to things that are going on around them and I'm not entirely sure what that lack of emotionality was supposed to represent whether it was like a lack of connection to the emotional world a lack of recognition of the gravity of holding people's lives in your hands literally as a doctor or a surgeon that they were emotionally removed from these situations Like if that's what they were trying to portray, I get it intellectually, but I just didn't enjoy it. It annoyed me massively. Colin Farrell throughout the film speaks in his normal Irish accent and that works for his character. It's absolutely fine. I don't think the emotionless delivery really suited him as an actor because to me, it just felt like bad acting rather than a directorial choice. Do you know what I'm saying? But Barry Keoghan, please somebody stop him from doing accents. I don't think he played weird, unsettling, dangerous character on the fringes well in this film. I I don't think it worked. In fact, I didn't really feel anything for any of the characters, except maybe Nicole Kidman's character. I thought she was the best out of all of them. But because of this flat delivery and Barry Keoghan's bad accent, I sort of didn't, didn't feel any sort of menace from him, really. And I know people might be annoyed at me saying that because I think... Barry Keoghan is a little bit of a poster boy at the moment and everybody's loving him. But I felt the same way in Saltburn. I was like, babe, you're slipping into your lovely Dublin accent regularly throughout this film. It's it's very disconcerting. There's also a lot of focus in the film on sexuality, but in a very disturbing way. I imagine this must be part of what the director wants to portray in general in his films. I felt the same way about poor things. There was lots and lots of sex that I felt very uncomfortable with. And in this film, it was quite similar And I do understand that like the human ego and the id are driven by sex a lot of the time and sex is part of the human condition and sexuality is part of the human condition. But there were elements of the sex portrayed in this film that I just found uncomfortable and not in a kind of revealing kind of way, but just in a way where I felt like, oh, this wasn't necessary and this has been added in maybe for shock value. And to be really frank, I disliked the doctor to an extent that I actually didn't care that his life was being ripped apart by this boy. I just didn't care. I just felt like, whatever, Dr. Stephen Murphy, like you're a bit of a knob and your morals are questionable. And again, I understand that this is probably part of the director's desire that he wants you to look at these moral, morally questionable people and question whether or not they deserve things that are being handed to them. But also, like, maybe it's just not for me. Maybe it's just not my vibe. I will say to kind of round this off that I recognised that the director, in my opinion, was asking questions about or posing questions about in dire situations, in situations of desperation, humans will make morally questionable decisions in order to survive. And it's a it's a serious moral quandary to look at and a moral conundrum. And you, you ask yourself, can I judge people for making those decisions, etc. And I respected that and I appreciated that element of the story. And there were also elements of the story, I think, that were cleverly left unsaid that made the viewer question the supernatural element of the story. Like, how are these things happening? And to kind of let the viewer draw their own conclusions, which again, I thought was clever. Fundamentally, though, This film was not for me. I did not enjoy it for originality and for the absolute terror of the score alone. 
I'm going to give it two stars out of five. But it definitely was not one that I would rush to recommend to people or to watch again. Have you ever Googled your own name? Prepare for a shock because your personal info, including addresses and phone numbers, is all out there. It's all harvested by data brokers and sold legally. Aura is a personal digital security service that scans the internet for your sensitive information and provides a full suite of privacy-enhancing tools. For a limited time, Aura is offering listeners a 14-day free trial at aura.com slash safety. That's A-U-R-A dot com slash safety to learn more and activate the 14-day trial period. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile, with a message for everyone paying big wireless way too much. Please, for the love of everything good in this world, stop. With Mint, you can get premium wireless for just $15 a month. Of course, if you enjoy overpaying, no judgments, but that's weird. Okay, one judgment. Anyway, give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. Upfront payment of $45 for three months required. New subscribers only. Renew for 12 months to lock in savings. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See mintmobile.com. Which brings us to our story this week. Now, our story this week came off the back of me posting a couple of bits on TikTok, as I generally do, and realising, wow, I have not talked about this in a long time, and it's long overdue, and I'm excited. Now, word of warning, this episode is slightly wild, a little bit bonkers, and was generally incredibly fun to research. So let's get into it. There is little I enjoy more than talking about fairy lore and all of its varied and nuanced elements. And this week we are going to be deep diving into the world of gnomes. And it sounds ridiculous, I know. When we think of gnomes today, we think of the little garden gnomes that are designed to hold kitschy little poses in your garden. The Disneyfication of gnomes has well and truly worked. And we think of them as being affable and sweet and generally harmless. But that's not always how gnomes were perceived. The word gnome itself comes from Renaissance Latin gnomus, which first appears in a book on nymphs, sylphs, pygmies and salamanders and other spirits by Paracelsus, published posthumously in Nysa in 1566. Paracelsus classified them as earth elementals. He describes them as two spans high, very reluctant to interact with humans and able to move through solid earth as easily as humans move through air. In the old legends, gnomes were earth spirits. They lived deep in the ground, able to pass through earth and rock at will. Their purpose was to guard and maintain the precious metals and mining systems that exist within the earth. But they weren't the cute, wholesome, bespectacled old men that we see today. They were small, deformed and ugly, and ultimately could be dangerous. Their duty was to protect the land, and they did not take too kindly to the greed of humans. For example, they are said to have caused the landslide that destroyed the Swiss village of Plurs in 1618. The villagers had become wealthy from a local gold mine created by the gnomes who poured liquid gold down into a vein for the benefit of humans. And the humans were corrupted by this newfound prosperity, which greatly offended the gnomes. Legends of gnomes and races of fey folk exist all over the world. Lurking on the fringes of societies are elves, gnomes, goblins, tomte, trolls, ibu gogo, makaya wisug, redcaps, the she, the menahune, the list is endless. And for the purpose of this episode, we are using the word gnome as an interchangeable descriptor for these creatures. The intentions of these entities vary. Some are benign and helpful, perhaps shy and keeping to the earth. But when in contact with deserving humans, they may help them out or bring them good fortune. But often they are not benign creatures. Often they cause havoc and mischief. They steal and destroy and punish humans who disturb their way of life. Dave Barcelo was sleeping soundly when the first booming crash happened. He jolted awake, initially unsure of what had awoken him from his deep sleep. Then his bedroom was illuminated with a cold white flash. It was a storm. And a big one. 
Dave was only a child. He was 10 years old and storms frightened the life out of him. Their farmhouse in the Hudson Valley was old, at least 100 years old, and the wind seemed to be able to get into every nook and cranny of the wooden structure. It whistled around, slamming doors and windows. But this time the wind brought a different sound with it. A sound that Dave had never heard before, and a sound that immediately filled him with terror. Despite the fact that he had no idea what the sound was. It was a strange, wailing howl. It was not the wind, it was not natural. It was not human or animal, and Dave's body immediately responded to it. He realised with horror that whatever was making this ungodly sound was outside his window. His body was covered in goosebumps and he clambered silently out of his bed and down the hall to his grandmother's bedroom. She was also awake and as he climbed into the bed beside her he could see the terror in her face. She could hear it too. What is it, Grandma? What is making that horrible sound? She held him and told him that it was nothing to worry about. It was just the wind and nothing more. But he knew it wasn't just the wind. And he knew that she knew that it wasn't just the wind. The howling had followed him, it seemed, and now it was right outside his grandmother's window. The howling died down with the storm, and the next morning his grandmother was gone. Dave went to find her, and she was on the front porch. She had a mop and a bucket and was furiously mopping the porch. Dave could see what she was cleaning. They were small, muddy footprints. He asked his grandmother what had made them and she didn't answer, just silently scrubbed them away. Many of the native people that lived in the Hudson Valley had stories and legends of little people, little people who were associated with storms. In South America, these creatures are known as duendes. One story, hailing from Argentina, tells of a woman who was going for an evening walk. She was walking through a semi-rural area outside of the town as the sun was setting when she heard a sound. It was a strange, loud, high-pitched shrieking. She assumed it was a trapped animal, but as she got closer she realised that the sound was a voice. It was tinny and high-pitched and clearly in a state of panic. It was shouting in a garbled language that she didn't understand. Again, at this point, she assumed that it was maybe a small child in trouble that was making the sound. But as she rounded the corner, she was shocked by what she saw. There, pinned against a wall, was a small man. He was not just small, he was around a foot tall. He was dressed in green clothes and looked like an old man. His features were wrinkled and wizened. He had white hair and a white beard and he was trapped against the wall shouting and flailing a tree branch at a cat who was crouched and ready to attack. The witness stated, He was a duende, that's what we call them. The cat had attacked him already, I could see he was hurt but he was fighting with his little stick and screaming out what I could only imagine were obscenities in whatever language it was. I felt compelled to do something so I called out. The cat, which had been totally focused on its prey, jumped in surprise and bolted off. The duende, he took some breaths, picked up a little hat that had fallen onto the ground and perched it on his head. He then looked at me with beady little eyes and gave an almost imperceptible nod as if to say thank you before scurrying around the wall and out of sight. I went to see if I could catch a glimpse of him again, but he was gone still wonder if he was okay. Another story comes from the town of Kennedy in Texas. The witness stated to the website World UFO Photos. I was working the night shift on an x-ray crew at a material gas plant. This was around 3am and there was only four of us in the plant at the time. I took this picture after seeing something swaying side to side out of the corner of my eye. I was in the basket of a man lift coming down when I took the picture. By the time I unhooked my harness to get out of the basket, the creature was gone. The police were called and walked the premises. 
The officer told me there were 26 UFO sighting calls throughout that night. If you zoom in, you can see the silhouettes of eyes and an elongated mouth. I have no doubt of what I believe I seen that night. The other person that saw it with me took off running for the truck. And as always with these stories, the photograph mentioned will be posted on Instagram, Facebook and Patreon. Another witness submitted their story to the website True Ghost Tales, where they stated that they were in South Texas with their family taking a walk. We began laughing and chasing one another as moms do, but about two miles down the road, my oldest son, Austin, let out this scream that made me immediately turn to see what was wrong. That was when I saw them. My son pointed down the road a bit, and there on the side of the road was four little people, Now when I say little people, I do not mean short, I mean about a foot tall. They were all wearing pointy little white hats and white clothes. Two of them were splashing arm in arm in the rain puddles that had collected on the side of the road, and one of them appeared to be filling up a bucket with the same water. The last one was the smallest and walked with a bit of a limp, and I noticed a fifth one that was much taller than all the rest and wore all black and had a shorter black hat on as well. I could tell right away that the one in black was obviously some sort of authority or leader and I watched as he picked the smallest one up and placed him on his shoulders. Now all this time we are standing there watching them and they seemed completely unaware of us. We just stood there, frozen, not believing what we were seeing. Then, out of nowhere, the leader, or the one in black, seemed to notice us and he turned to the others, obviously telling them it was time to go because they stopped what they were doing right away and followed the biggest one into the tall grass. We walked up to the place where they had been after waiting a while to be sure that they were not coming back, and there were a bunch of tiny bare footprints left behind in the mud, along with weird writing that looked a lot like hieroglyphics. We looked around the area, and I gotta tell you, there was no place around there they could have gone without us seeing them, or them having to cross the road to the other side where the woods were. But that wasn't the end of the encounter. She went on to say that she went out for a smoke. And I couldn't believe it. There they were again, just at the edge of my property, staring at me. With such curiosity that for some reason made me not feel afraid of them. They began to copy or mimic my movements and when I put my hand on my hips, they did so too. I finally sat down on my mother's old wheelchair and noticed how curious they seemed about the chair. I went inside after a while and in the morning... When I went back out, there were lots of tiny muddy footprints all over the concrete patio leading up to the old wheelchair and all over the chair itself. I had to laugh, it just seemed so surreal to have really seen them and now this. Since then I've seen the tiny people numerous times and each time they seem to be observing me. I've never gotten any bad feelings or ill intentions from them so I'm not scared of them anymore. But I gotta say this is the weirdest thing I have ever heard of. And the eyewitness accounts continue. According to the website Mysterious Universe, a man was out hiking with his father and brothers on the Salmon River in 1965 when the following happened. It was a mildly warm day and he stopped to rest in the shade of some large boulders to strip off some of his gear and have a drink of water. When he sat down to rest, he felt a rock zip right by his head. Thinking it was one of his brothers playing a trick on him, he yelled at them to stop. That's when he noticed tiny footprints in the soft dust under his feet. And again, another rock was thrown in his direction, closer this time. Now my dad has always been told about the little people who lived in the rocks and crevices of mountains and hills. An ancient band of Native Americans who barely escaped from the white man. They made their home in the hills and if bothered would put a curse on you if you failed to heed their warnings. Feeling a chill creep up his spine, he slowly rose, gathered his things and said in very slow shoshone, I am leaving. I am sorry I disturbed you. As he walked away downhill, he heard small feet slapping the rocks behind him. But being a tad afraid, he never looked back. He never told his father or his brothers and could hardly tell me for fear of me thinking he was crazy. I believe him. In the Cherokee Nation forest in Tennessee, a Reddit user experienced something similar. We both stopped in our tracks. 
There was a tree directly ahead of us about 20 feet. At the base of the tree, I briefly saw the silhouette of three beings. They were around three feet tall and very slender, and all of them seemed to be holding a stick or a staff in one hand. One was holding a staff and with the other hand was pointing at something on the ground next to the tree and all of them were looking at it. It was as though when we rounded the bend we caught a brief glimpse of them and then they vanished. I did not tell my boyfriend what I had seen but he went on to describe the exact same thing. So of course we ran over to the tree to see if we could discover what they were so fascinated by. I didn't expect to see anything but dirt and leaves but there was actually a neat looking rock sitting right where they had pointed. We love collecting the rocks that we find while hiking, but we left this one the hell alone. And another one from Virginia where a woman was helping clear her aunt and uncle's house as they were moving out. As she was going about her chores, she noticed that the attic door was ajar and the light was turned on. I had been in and out of the house all day and knew that not one person had been into the attic. My mother detests attics and my aunt won't be caught dead climbing up into one. So I found this all to be a little strange. I continued on my way to the room where I gathered the blankets and then headed back into the hallway. As I was leaving, I looked up into the open attic and there appeared to be a man. To this day, his appearance has always baffled me for he was not so much a man but an elf-like creature. He wore his hair long and over it was a pointed hat. His clothes were tattered and I can remember them being green. His skin was brown and his eyes black. He was small, no taller than three feet. He was not a lean creature and was actually quite round about the middle. He sat hunched over the square opening of the attic, looking down at me with a malicious grin. I froze. Come here, little girl. To which I did not respond. Little girl, come up here, he said again. His voice, I remember, was a harsh one. High-pitched, but at the same time deep and threatening. Even as a child, I knew that what I was seeing was not human and it was not good. I stood there in a sort of paralysed state, staring at this thing in the attic for what seemed like an eternity, while he again and again repeated, Come here, little girl. Come up here, little girl. Then, as if my brain was finally able to get through to my feet, I ran. I believe I would have run through a wall of linebackers to get out of that house. I could hear him laughing as I took off, a dangerous laugh. One that to this day will raise the hairs on my arms and neck. Immediately I told my mother and aunt what I had experienced, and they just as immediately wrote me off as having an overactive imagination. After much pleading, I got them to go into the hallway where, lo and behold, the attic door was open and the light was still on. The little man I had described to my mother and aunt had vanished. It was obvious that I was not the one to have done this, being that I was not of the right height to even reach the door, let alone the light inside which hung another three feet above the opening. Needless to say, the packing was left unfinished, and the three of us promptly left the house with a phone call to my aunt's ex, informing him that he could finish emptying the house himself. And of course, these stories don't just happen in America. As I said earlier in this episode, legends and lore of goblins and elves in their various forms exist all over the world. This story comes from the Reddit thread, Has anyone had experience with gnomes, dwarves, fairies, nymphs, dryads and other forest creatures? I have never ever divulged this information to anyone. I guess because I don't even fully believe it myself, it is too outrageous. I live in Australia. Roughly a year ago, I was sitting at a bench in a park surrounded by woodland. I was watching my daughter play on the equipment until some movement to my right caught my attention. Something darted behind a tree trunk. I kept watching, thinking maybe it was a wallaby or something. Boy, was I wrong. I looked back at my daughter and then absentmindedly looked around again at the tree trunk. And there was a gnome. That's the only way I can describe it. It was a type of tiny person, maybe 30 centimetres tall. What is the most unbelievable part is that it really was like a garden gnome. Red hat and rosy cheeks, I remember that it had darkly coloured lips. It was looking at me. With what I can only describe as a malevolent look, it looked evil. I saw it for about 5 or 10 seconds before something caused me to quickly look back at my daughter, 
and when I looked back, the gnome was gone. I immediately took my daughter home. I suffered terrible anxiety and nightmares after. I had this fear that the gnome hitched a ride home with us and that it was constantly watching me from around corners and moving items around the house. Definitely one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in my life. I don't know if my mind created the image of the gnome or what, but what I felt was not friendly. So these encounters are happening all over the world and are often reported anonymously by people who are terrified of ridicule if they talk about what they have seen or experienced. But what is happening here? What are these people experiencing? Our experiences and discussions around the paranormal often revolve around traditional religiously influenced ideas of good and evil, angels and demons. But the Fae don't exist in that realm. They seem to be connected to the earth, like elementals, and they seem to follow their own rules. And there doesn't seem to be any rules or pattern to their interactions with humans. Some seem to be shy and reluctant to engage with humans, seeming to be shocked and scared when they are perceived by humans. And some seem to revel in causing havoc for humans, their interactions laced with feelings of fear and terror. There are myriad stories of gnomes wreaking havoc in people's lives, breaking items, stealing items and hiding items. Many historians suggest that the existence of the Fae is etiological. This means that their existence was created to try and explain events. For example... If your crops failed, well, you must have annoyed the Fae somehow. If you lose shiny items around your house, well, it must have been gnomes. You get the gist. But that doesn't seem to quite fit the modern context. The stories that we looked at today happened to people who were just going about their daily lives, not remotely expecting to come face to face with a creature that seems to be straight out of a children's storybook. Admittedly, although these stories are generally completely benign, I find them completely unsettling. As I was writing this, I kept glancing at the gap in my door, expecting to see some beady black eyes and a malicious grin staring back at me. That didn't happen. But what is interesting is that when I posted about gnomes on TikTok, I expected that people would be having a laugh in the comments and making jokes. But for the most part, people were discussing their experiences and beliefs around these creatures. To finish out today's episode, I wanted to share a story that I came across that is all about gnomes, but may dispel some of these feelings of discomfort. This story comes from a Mysterious Universe article that was written by Brent Swanser on the 6th of June 2018, and it is the incredible true story of the Woolerton Park gnomes. Truly one of the otter cases of gnome encounters occurred in 1979, at the quiet, verdant Woolerton Park in Nottingham in England, known for its expanses of tree-dotted green and the magnificent Woolerton Hall, which was used in the film The Dark Knight Rises. It was here that on October the 29th, 1979, a group of six schoolchildren by the names of Angie, her brother Glenn, her sister Julie, as well as Andrew and Rosie, who were brother and sister, and a boy named Patrick, all of whom ranged in age from eight to ten years old, and were out wandering around in the late afternoon hours as the sun began to dim and as the day began to come to a close. Realising that they soon had to get on their way home, they nevertheless had their curiosity piqued when they reportedly came to a fenced-off area of murky overgrown swampland near the lake that was closed to the public. Being kids, the fence and the sign warning people to keep out might as well have been an open invitation to come on in and the children decided to sneak in to poke around this forbidden treasure. Upon entering, the children would claim that they soon heard the chime of a bell, after which they had come across a group of dozens of tiny little men, about half their own height, who had deeply wrinkled faces and sported lush white beards with red tips. On their heads were strange little pointed caps, described as looking sort of like nightcaps with bobbles on the ends and their clothing was composed of yellow or green tights and blue shirts. Strangest of all is that the children claimed the curious little men drove about in miniature bubble-like cars that had no steering wheels, bells instead of horns, and which produced no engine sounds, yet sped around at high speeds and could easily jump over and evade obstacles. 
According to the children, there were about 30 of these unusual mini vehicles, with two of the gnomes riding in each, laughing joyously and gleefully whizzing about, and even on occasion playfully chasing or making passes at the startled witnesses. This is how one of the witnesses described them. We heard this little tinkly bell. We started running and these little men came out of the bushes. There were about 60 of them in 30 cars like bubble cars. They were half my size and looked old. They had greenish faces with crinkles in them and long white beards with a bit of red on the end. They were laughing in a funny way and driving over swamps near the lake. We were frightened and ran to the gate. I don't think they liked the lights outside because they didn't follow us to the street. The children claimed that they had spent around 15 minutes watching these bizarre figures cavort and drive about the swamp before they finally left for home with the coming of night. The entities were described as being quite cheerful, playful and not threatening or aggressive in the slightest. When they told adults what they had seen, no one would believe them, yet they adamantly insisted that it had all been real. The school headmaster would go on to extensively question the kids on what they had seen, and came to the conclusion that they at least believed they were telling the truth. He would later say of a recording he made of their conversations, I think the tape reveals the wide measure of corroboration between the children, as well as the fluency with which they were able to describe the events. I remain sceptical as to the explanation of what they saw, but I am also convinced that the children were describing a real occurrence. Despite wide-ranging scepticism, the tale of the Woolerton fairies made headlines in the news at the time, and oddly, more people came forward with their own sightings of the same thing in the area. One such sighting was written of in Janet Board's book, Fairies, Real Encounters with Little People, which she writes of thus. Over six years before the Woolerton fairies were reported in the media, I'd corresponded with Marina Fry of Cornwall, who wrote to me giving details of her own fairy sighting when she was nearly four years old around 1940. One night, she and her older sisters, all sleeping in one bedroom, awoke to hear a buzzing noise. One sister said music and bells. Looking out of the window, they saw a little man in a tiny red car driving around in circles. He was about 18 inches tall and had a white beard and a droopy pointed hat. He just disappeared after a while. Author and researcher and former secretary of the Nottingham-based Fairy Investigation Society, Marjorie Johnson, also confirmed that there had been various other sightings of bubble car driving gnomes in the Woolerton Park area, in particular near the lake, and wrote of these in her book Seeing Fairies. One sighting was made by a Mrs. C. George, who sighted the gnomes playing about by the park gates with their cars parked to the side. In yet another sighting, a Mrs. Brown claimed to have been guided around the park by the gnomes in a sort of game, wherein they would reward her with a feather at each checkpoint they reached. In yet another encounter, a Jean Dixon claimed that she had witnessed gnomes roaming around the park who seemed eager to show her around their abode. Interestingly, Johnson had her own sighting of gnomes in the early 1900s when she claimed that she spied several tiny men about three feet in height frolicking about dressed as policemen. As recently as 2016, there have been gnome phenomena in the park, such as news reports in the park herald that railways in the area were being haunted by the miniature humanoids to the point that interrupted services on trains running from Nottingham Station to London St Pancras were being blamed on the little menaces. One witness, named Daniel Sedgwick, saw a gnome lurking around a train embankment and said of it, All of a sudden, I caught a glimpse of five small hat-wearing creatures tearing down the side of the embankment just after passing through Attenborough. Now, as to whether these creatures pose any threat to people in the area, a professor of gnomic studies named Professor Gregory Landau put people's mind at ease, telling the Park Herald that gnomes are traditionally benign in attitude and general behaviour. To be honest, they consider courtesy and discretion to be amongst the highest attributes of their social code. There are a handful of unconfirmed writings pertaining to a certain suborder, castigated from gnomic society, who have a renown for mischief and borderline thuggery. 
As for gnomes attacking people, there have never been any documented occurrences. In recent times, there has been a resurgence in interest in the case, when writer and historian Dr. Simon Young expressed interest in reinvigorating the case by bringing together the witnesses again. Young believes that this is a singularly unique case in that so many witnesses saw so many of the creatures, all while their reports remained remarkably consistent across the board. He said that this experience was interesting in several respects. There are many instances of children coming face to face with fairies, but I know of none where six saw the fae together. So many 14 experiences depend on a single shaky witness or poor chain of custody for the evidence. This is not the case with Woolerton. What is it these people were seeing in Woolerton Park? Is this just overactive imaginations or is there some high strangeness going on here? If they are indeed real, then what are they? And what is it that draws these entities to this particular place? Whatever the case may be, the Woolerton Gnomes case with their odd little vehicles is certainly one of the weirder sightings of gnomes out there. Those are the types of gnomes that I can get on board with, okay? Gnomes driving little bubble cars around the place, yes please. Gnomes being mischievous and cute and sweet towards humans, yes please. I actually wasn't going to include the Woolerton Park story. I had come across it when I was searching for stories of gnomes and it just made me giggle and I thoroughly enjoyed it, right? And then I posted on TikTok about, you know, gnome stories and I said, oh, I'm doing a gnome story this week for this week's episode on Sunday. And somebody commented and said, oh, I really hope that you're including the Woolerton Park gnomes. And I was like, go on then. I'm going to include it. I will say that when I was researching for this episode and I can't bloody find the particular website where I saw this but I know that I saw it I saw a forum that was discussing the Woolerton Park gnomes and in this forum they said that the children the children at the time who are now obviously adults had come forward to say that you know they had made it up that it hadn't actually happened and they were just being silly and ridiculous I think if I remember correctly the comment was something along the lines of oh one of the witnesses Patrick was my cousin and he told me that the whole thing was made up. Now, anybody can say that on an online forum, right? But also the story is absolutely wild. But there are a couple of things that are worth considering about this story. Firstly, that apparently the children's stories remained the same. Now, if you've ever worked with children or or have your own children or spend time with children, you will know that when they're lying, <laughs> their stories will often change dramatically. So, I've I've had it numerous times where an incident has occurred in school and I'll get a bunch of kids to write a statement about what happened and you can immediately t- <laughs> tell who's lying or immediately tell if they're all lying because all of their stories will be different and I find it interesting that apparently these children they they remained consistent in their stories and just to say there are podcasts books and blog posts that have properly deep dove into this story that if you're interested in it will definitely be worth checking out because just just fundamentally it's interesting because we look at things like the Cottingley fairies right where these girls claim to take pictures of fairies and people jumped on board I mean I think even in those days it was clear that these pictures weren't real right they looked like cardboard cutouts But people used it to justify experience that they had had or to validate experience that they had had. I I think it's really interesting that with this story, you have this woman, Marina Fry of Cornwall in 1940. She looks out the window, sees a little man in a tiny red car driving around in circles, her and her sisters. And then we have Marjorie Johnson saw uh, bubble car driving gnomes in the Woolerton area. You know, other people like this... Uh, Mrs. Brown was guided around the park by the gnomes and they gave her a feather at each checkpoint they reached. Who decided these checkpoints? Who knows? Why are you following gnomes around the park? I can tell you now that I would not be doing that. If I saw them and they were friendly, I'd be like, thank you, I'm leaving, thank you for not dragging me to the underworld or filling my bed with blackthorns. If you're an Irish person who grew up in the Irish education system, you will understand that reference to your bed being filled with blackthorns. And I'm sorry... Johnson had her own sighting of gnomes in the early 1900s when she claimed she spied several tiny men three feet in height frolicking around dressed as policemen. Who's making these gnome costumes? That's what I want to know. And to what end? I will also add that I think the National Rail Service in England has stooped to a new low. If you are blaming gnomes 
for your delayed services to London St Pancras, then that is a new low. And my takeaway from this story is that I think it's a lovely, sweet, fun, silly story. Nobody gets hurt. The kids see this thing. They go and tell everybody that they've seen it. People are interested because it's such a wild story. But it also brings about other people who say, look, I've had a similar experience and here's what happened to me. And I think if you're going to believe in gnomes, I don't think it's fair then to be like, well, that story is ridiculous because what? how would they be driving bubble cars around the place? Because you know what? If we're talking about gnomes and we're talking about gnomes existing in our world, then who are we to decide what they can or can't drive? We cannot make decisions about their vehicular accessibility because we simply do not know. And before I go any further into the creepier aspects of these stories, as always, the links to all of my to all of my sources are in the description of this episode. I relied very heavily on various Mysterious Universe articles for this episode and they're all linked in the description. If you're interested in reading stories about gnomes or fairy tale creatures or people having experiences with gnomes, goblins, elves, whatever, honestly, Mysterious Universe will take you down a rabbit hole and is well worth checking out, getting into and allowing yourself to fall down that fey rabbit hole. And there's some great stories. There's some outlandish stories. There's some stories that will give you the heebie-jeebies. Mysterious Universe in general, the website is a great source of spooky stories and deep dives into spooky stories. And I would highly recommend having a read of those links in the description of this episode if you want to read more spooky gnome stories. But now to get to the more creepy, sinister elements of these stories. So etiologically speaking, which is a word that I learned through this research, which is basically that it is something that is created by humans to explain events. So, you know, when we didn't understand that crops failed because of various pests, etc., people might blame fairies or supernatural creatures. The first thing that was interesting to me is this this high pitched tinny voice speaking in a garbled language that we come across in the first Duende story in this particular episode. Now, if you cast your mind back to the episode, I think it's number 78, that's called The She for Beverly. One of the features or one of the characteristics of the goblin-y gnome creature that is experienced in one of those stories is this garbled, high-pitched language that nobody could understand. And I mean, this person is just out for a walk and they come face to face with a cat who is hunting a gnome. And there was a whole Mysterious Universe article dedicated to animals attacking gnomes. Because apparently it's a far more regular thing than we would anticipate. But it makes sense. You know, if they are a physical being that is knocking around, they're going to have natural predators like owls or cats or foxes. It makes sense. And for the most part, these experiences are, you know, they're they're quite benign it's people who are out for a hike, people who are out for a stroll, they see something, they can't believe what they see. I mean, I did find the idea of two of the little little gnomes splashing arm in arm in the rain puddles. Uh, that's very that's very Disney-esque, isn't it? But for the most part, they're pretty sweet interactions that are more so defined by a sense of curiosity from both sides rather than terror. And even the situation with the man hunting with his father and his brothers and he gets some rocks flung at him and then he's like, okay, I am not welcome here. I'm very sorry I disturbed you. I'm going to leave. Totally understand that too. You are in their territory. You are being respectful. You are leaving and therefore they're like, fine, you know, go and we'll leave you alone. However, the story about the girl who is doing her chores in the house where the attic door had been opened honestly gave me chills that I think reverberated down into my soul. It made me question the intentionality of this creature. Like, what what, what if she had gone up to the attic? What then? And that, I feel, doesn't even bear thinking about. Secondly, there's also the implication that there are lots of different races of these creatures. You know, because some people say that they're like a foot tall, little men with beards that wear pointy hats, who's... Who's making all the clothes in in the world of gnomes? That's what I want to know. Or they're like, you know, three foot tall, grotesque, humanoid creatures who are, you know, who seem to be more bad than good. And then some people are describing them as being like, literally like garden gnomes. Are all of these things existing simultaneously? I'd love to know. 
my takeaway from this is that I would never like to experience witnessing a gnome, elf, goblin, fairy, whatever it is. I don't care if it's benign. I don't care if it's malevolent. I don't want to see it. I don't care if it's a foot tall. I don't care if it's three foot tall. I don't care if it's in a bubble car and I don't care if it's giving me feathers. I don't want to see it. But I think it's interesting that these people are having these experiences. Maybe they're all some case of mistaken identity. Maybe all of these people have witnessed something and projected their ideas about the supernatural, about fairy lore onto this thing that they have seen. When there's more than one witness, is it a case of a mass hallucination or is it a case of they see something and then one person suggests it was a gnome driving a little red car around in circle and everybody else agrees with that memory, even though it's not the actual thing that they witnessed. Whatever the case may be, the Fae remain one of my favourite things to talk about on the podcast, even though I'm slightly afraid to talk about them most of the time. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like to send in your story, whether it's about gnomes or otherwise, you can do so by emailing it to reallifeghoststoriespodcast at gmail.com. You can also check out the website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com. And if you are desperate for some extra content, you can subscribe to the Patreon. That is patreon.com forward slash stories, where for $5 a month or $2 a month, you get access to heaps of extra content, as well as every single main and mini episode completely ad free. And on that note, I shall see you next time. Get ahead of postage rate increases this year with Stamps.com. It's like your own personal post office. Sign up with promo code PROGRAM for a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com code PROGRAM.